The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Visit christies.com to find out more about the world's leading auction house since 1766. Auction, private sales, online, art, anytime. Hello, it's The Week in Art. I'm Ben Luke. This week, the art fraudster Inigo Philbrick is the art world, as his lawyer claimed, corrupt from top to bottom. Plus, Warhol and Catholicism and new museums in Moscow. I talked to Georgina Adam about Inigo Philbrick, the latest young art world figure to plead guilty to fraud, and how widespread corruption is in the market. For this week's Work of the Week, I talked to Carmen Hermo, the curator of the exhibition Andy Warhol Revelation at the Brooklyn Museum, about Warhol's Catholicism. And as guest two, House of Culture opens in Moscow next week, and the Garage Museum in the Russian capital announces its expansion, both in converted 20th century buildings, I talked to Anna Brenovitska about the museums and the wider political situation in which they're being constructed. Before that, a new series of our sister podcast, A Brush With, has just begun, featuring in-depth conversations with artists about the art, music, literature and film that's inspired them and the cultural experiences that have shaped their lives and work. The first two interviews in this series are with distinctive South African artists, Billy Zangewa and Candice Brights. Do subscribe to A Brush With and this podcast wherever you're listening now. And if you like what we do, please give us a rating or review on Apple Podcasts. It helps others to find us. Now, Inigo Philbrick, the art dealer who lived a lavish lifestyle yet allegedly fleeced collectors, investors and lenders out of millions of dollars before fleeing to a tropical island, last week pleaded guilty to fraud charges in a New York criminal court. He faces a maximum sentence of 20 years in prison, though his attorneys brokered a deal with the prosecution that would likely keep his sentence down to between 10 and 12 years. After the hearing, Philbrick's attorney, Jeffrey Lickman, said that the art industry is corrupt from top to bottom, that Philbrick was not the cause but the symptom and that he suspected many more cases like this would appear if the art world were investigated thoroughly. So, is he right? I spoke to Georgina Adam, one of the art newspaper's editors at large, about Philbrick and just how widespread this kind of behaviour is in the industry. Georgina, perhaps we can begin with talking about Inigo Philbrick. Who is he? So, Inigo Philbrick has just pleaded guilty in a Manhattan court to basically scamming his clients out of $86 million in the art world. And he has a very colourful history because, well, he legged it, basically. He left, he had a gallery in Mayfair, he had a gallery in Miami, and then a trail, as it turned out, of infuriated creditors who were after him. And so he went to its tiny little speck in the Pacific, Vanuatu, I think it's called, where I think he thought he couldn't be picked up, but he was. He was actually in flip-flops when FBI agents... That's a lovely detail. (laughs) Yes, he was in his flip-flops and he was apparently walking along a road when um, he was grabbed by FBI agents and he was flown back to America where he has now appeared in court and he has pled guilty. So we we know he admits it. Right. Um, You say he was a dealer in London. Were you aware of him as, you know, as an art market reporter? Did you know of him? Was he somebody you came across? I did. I was aware of him because he came up sort of through the ranks. He went to White Cube and then he set up his own gallery and The rumours were, and I think they were true, that Jay Joplin actually financed what was ultimately a secondary market business. So he was reselling works of art uh, for White Cube, but probably also, but as it turns out, for himself as well. Right. And and so it sounds like he was he was a genuine enthusiast. He knew his stuff and he was particularly dealing in certain artists. Is that right? Yes, absolutely. He definitely had huge knowledge of a few markets. He particularly knew the Christopher Wool market and he knew the Rudolf Stingel market absolutely through and through. I think there's no doubt about that. Um, he came from a from, from a cultivated background. His father is a museum director and he'd worked for White Cube, but he'd come up, as I said, through the ranks of a gallery. So I think he was knowledgeable. What happened? Did he start off intending to swindle people? Personally, I don't know, but I doubt it. I think he probably started off as an art dealer, genuinely, and then he got in over his head. And I think one of the things that struck me reading Kenny Schachter's very colourful story in Vulture about 
his dealings with Inigo Philbrick. And he was obviously very close to him, literally travelling around the world with him, going to parties with him, drinking a lot, by all accounts. But one of the things that you can see in that tale is the lavish life that Philbrick was living and how that was all part of it. And, of course, it's a part of so many people's perception of the art world and, indeed, enjoyment of the art world. Yes, I think it's a bit unfortunate because this this alcohol and other substances fueled lifestyle, the private planes, um, is what a lot of people think the art world is like. And it's true that there is a little section of that at the top end where it's a very moneyed lifestyle, but it's not the whole art world. And I do think that it's important to emphasize that there is another art business, there's another art world, as well as this particular almost caricature. Right. And there are certain practices that Philbrick used that are not in themselves illegal, but are all part of the kind of opaqueness of how works are bought and sold, right? Can you explain briefly some of the kinds of ways in which, for instance, multiple owners of works and that kind of thing? Yes. I mean, this this does reveal quite a lot about that end of the art business because it still is a very personal business. It's done on a handshake. Contracts don't exist. Now, you wouldn't buy a house without having a surveyor crawl all over it. And yet people within the this art world, you know, will buy shares of, a, of an artwork or think they're buying the whole artwork. But of course, Philbrick, who was running into money troubles, he would sell shares in more than 100% of shares in the artwork. The other thing, which is perfectly legitimate, is borrowing against art. And this Philbrick did as well. Art backed loans are worth, and the figures I have are a bit out of date now, but it was a business that was worth $20 billion in 2017. So it's a huge business, particularly in America, not so much in Europe for various legal reasons. And so what you do is you pitch up with your work of art to an art lender, a specialized art lender, or to a bank. Uh, Banks do it. And indeed, Sotheby's does it as well. You show them the work of art and say, can I borrow money against it? And Philbrick did this as well. And the problem was that he didn't pay it back. Right. So basically, it all added up to multiple creditors, all of whom, it seems, ended up talking to each other and saying, ah, we've been had, effectively. Yes, yes. And of course, one of the problems was that the um, various creditors didn't know that the other people also had parts of this works of art. And he, he does seem as well, he seems to have also forged a document. Um, this was a, a work of art that was sold and he forged it and showed it to one of the people in whom he was in business with. Um, this was a German art advisory firm. So he really left a tale, trail of destruction behind him. And I presume that so many of those transactions are now in the courts being filtered through and sorted out, right? Yes, they are indeed. And in fact, I think that there's a Kusama installation that's still sitting in a museum in Florida while they try to sort out who actually owns it. Oh, extraordinary. Um, now, one of the reasons that we wanted to talk about Phil Brick, because of course this happens a fair amount, we regularly report on fraud in the art newspaper and it's happened quite a lot recently in terms of particularly sort of young uh, wheeler dealers who seem to have come a cropper. Philbrick's attorney after he had pled guilty said that the entire art industry is rotten effectively, that there is corruption from top to bottom. Um, To what extent is there a grain of truth in that or how outrageous do you think that statement is? Well I was outraged by it because yes it's certain that there is wrongdoing particularly at the top end and particularly I think in the contemporary art market. But to say that the whole industry is rotten is is just so erroneous and so insulting, quite frankly, for people who are applying perfectly honest livings, running galleries, running art fairs, all of the advisors, the conservators, all of these people are perfectly honest people. Um, the big problem with the art market is, and this is, comes back over and over again, it's unregulated. Now, To say it's completely unregulated is again wrong. It's not totally unregulated. On the contrary, I mean, auctions will point out a raft of um, various regulations that they have to uh, abide by. But it's not regulated the way the financial services industry is regulated, for example. So um, the fact that you don't have to reveal buyers and sellers, the fact that prices and pricing tend to be opaque, does 
open the door for, for wrongdoing. There's no doubt about it. Right. Um, your book that came out a couple of years ago was called Dark Side of the Boom, and it talked about the excesses of the art world. This is a very clear example of that, isn't it? Isn't yes. It? And there are all multiple forms of excesses that you wrote about. In the yes, book. yes, and unfortunately it is true. But, I mean, I would like to point out that the art business is not the only business that's got excesses and that's got tons of wrongdoing. I mean, let's just for a moment look at financial services and Bernie Madoff, for example. There was also a wonderful person, this goes back a bit, who managed to sell the Eiffel Tower twice. So let's not imagine that the art business is the only business that's got rotten apples. Do you think that there's a genuine will within the art business to make it less opaque and to regulate it more, though? Because at the moment, isn't that part of the reason that we're experiencing this seemingly never-ending boom, that precisely because of that lack of regulation or, or lack of total regulation? I'm going to say something a bit controversial. I don't think that People in the art trade terribly want more regulation. However, regulations are coming in, and one that I think is very significant is um, the Anti-Money Laundering Directive Number 5, which has come in recently. And that is, I think, going to make it much more difficult for what they call art market participants. They cannot accept money. Um, they, the sum is, I think, €10,000 um, they cannot accept that without doing quite extensive checks on the source of the money. So I think that, that regulation is coming, um, perhaps not initiated by the trade itself. Uh, the other thing is that you do have various associations, you know, like SLAD in London, uh, the Society of London Art Dealers, and they have codes of practice. So I think this is also good. And for anybody who wants to buy, I think it would be a good thing to check that the person they're buying from belongs to one of these associations. And that's a form of self-regulation. But it's difficult to regulate the art market because we're talking about a business that goes from huge auction houses down to little tiny single dealers. And it's very difficult to find a way of regulating so many different, a global industry and so many different players of different sizes. But what about the artists? Because, of course, their markets are going to be affected by this, aren't they? To what extent are they aware of what was going on and how much will it affect their market? I think they cannot not be unaware of what's happening. But, of course, it is out of their hands because we're talking with Stinger, we're talking about a secondary market. So they've painted the work, they've sold it on the primary market, and then it's traded and flipped. And I think it's it's kind of hard for them. They must be pleased in a way that they see their works making a great uh, price. But it's also dangerous for them because in the case of Stingel, um, and really what was a big problem for Philbrick was when the market turned. And he was heavily invested in Stingel, and he believed that Stingels would go up and they went down. And then, of course, that's like a gambler, what happened was that Philbrick got in over his head. So you try to do a second deal to try to catch up the money you've lost on the first deal. If you lose money on the second deal, you know, and so you dig yourself into a deeper and deeper hole. Yeah. I mean, do you think that the fact that there are three notable um, cases in which there are young fraudsters who've, who've been caught and they, we've reported on them at length, um, do you think this is a sort of, uh, this sends a message that actually the art world isn't so unregulated that you're not going to get caught out there. Because I think it seems to me that, you know, again, he was attracted by the kind of lavishness. He was attracted by the sloshing about of money mm. and, and felt he could get away with it. And, and it seems to me that it's quite important that we have this real landmark case in terms of proving that actually maybe the art world isn't completely rotten. And not only this case, because you've got the um, Angela Gulbenkian case, she pleaded guilty as well. And you had the Anna Delvey case, Anna Sorokin, a.k.a. Anna Delvey, who, who has actually done jail time. So I think this, this is these are warning shots across the bows of people. But I think what's important is that uh, it's the buyers, the people who buy works of art through somebody should be taking a very close look at the contracts, making sure there is a contract, for example, not just on a handshake. It's all very intriguing. Thank mm. you, Georgina, for telling us about it. Thank you for having me.
You can read more on Inigo Philbrick at theartnewspaper.com or on our app for iOS and Android, which you can get from the App Store and Google Play. And Georgina will reflect more on this topic in our Art Market Eye newsletter, which is out next week. You can sign up for that and all our newsletters at the website. Click on the newsletter link at the top left of the page. And Georgina's book, Dark Side of the Boom, The Excesses of the Art Market in the 21st Century, is still available from Lund Humphreys and priced £19.99. Coming up, we hear about Andy Warhol's Catholicism and new museums in Moscow. But first, here are a few of the top stories on our website this week. Three sculptures looted from the ancient city of Palmyra and seized by Swiss customs officers in the Geneva Freeport have been returned to Syria's permanent mission at the United Nations. As Catherine Hickley writes, the sculptures dating from the 2nd or 3rd century were smuggled into Switzerland in 2009 or 2010, before the outbreak of the Syrian war. Customs officers discovered them, along with one looted piece from Libya and five from Yemen, during a routine check at the Freeport in 2013. They had been stored at the Musée d'Art et d'Histoire in Geneva for safekeeping, but Syria claimed the three sculptures at a Geneva tribunal in 2020 and they were delivered to the Syrian ambassador to the United Nations on the 18th of November. Dave Hickey, the cultural critic whose quick-witted work both democratised and bisected the art world, has died aged 82, as Wallace Ludell writes. Hickey died in his home in Santa Fe, New Mexico. The cause of death was heart disease. Hickey was acclaimed for his wide-ranging cultural writing, including Air Guitar, Essays on Art and Democracy. That book, according to the Los Angeles Times art critic Christopher Knight, is easily the most widely read book of art criticism to appear in our time. A self-portrait by the Italian painter Ottone Rossi is at the centre of a long-running tussle between the Uffizi Gallery in Florence, the Italian Ministry of Culture and the Munich-based art dealer Daniel Blau. As Georgina Adam reports, Blau bought the painting at the Farsettiate auction house in Prato in December 2020 for €30,000 with fees, but it was subject to a compulsory purchase by the Italian state and given to the Uffizi. Blau has still not been reimbursed and all attempts to obtain payment, he says, have been unsuccessful. The Uffizi press office told the art newspaper that the purchase was made not by the museum but the Italian Ministry of Culture and the Uffizi galleries are only the destination of the painting. You can read these stories and much more on the website and the app. We'll be back after this. The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. History has a new story to tell this November and December during Classic Week at Christie's London. Discover art from antiquity to the 21st century in a different light, presented across five live auctions and four online-only sales. Highlights include Constable Salisbury Cathedral from the Bishop's Grounds, an attic red-figured Nolan Amphora attributed to Hermanax, an early El Greco masterpiece, Rembrandt's celebrated landscape The Three Trees, the Charles Darwin family microscope, Robert G and Il Savata's collection, of European ceramics, glass, silver and gold boxes, and more. Alongside this, explore the through line from past to present in a collaboration between works on offer during the Antiquities auction and installations by Sergio Roger, marking the Barcelona-based textile artist's London debut. Auction highlights are on view at Christie's now, ahead of the pre-sale exhibition beginning on the 3rd of December. Discover more on christies.com slash classicweek. Now, last week, Andy Warhol Revelation opened at the Brooklyn Museum after a pre-pandemic stint at the Andy Warhol Museum in Pittsburgh. It features more than 100 works from well-known paintings such as The Last Supper to archival material and attempts to bring a fresh perspective to Warhol, exploring in depth his references to Catholic themes. In a eulogy following Warhol's death in 1987, the critic and Picasso scholar John Richardson drew attention to what he called a side of Warhol's character that he hid from all but his closest friends, his spiritual side. The exhibition seeks to explore what it describes as the tension between Warhol's spiritual upbringing and his life as an out gay man. For this week's Work of the Week, I spoke to Carmen Hermo, the curator of the Brooklyn exhibition, about a painting in the show, New York Post, Judge Blasts Lynch, from 1983. You can see an image of the work on our website. Click on the Podcasts tab and look for this episode. Carmen, you've chosen one of the sort of least let's say it, iconic works of the Warhol canon to talk about. And that makes it all the more intriguing. Tell us about it. Yes, that was definitely on purpose. I think Warhol, as we know, needs no introduction. (laughs) And perhaps um, Andy Warhol Revelation, the exhibition itself, kind of could be seen as a reintroduction to perhaps a new, underknown, underseen aspect, really career-long engagement by Warhol of the themes of Catholicism. Um, And so when I selected the piece, uh, which is titled 
you know, in that Andy Warhol way, New York Post judge blasts Lynch. So that's uh, the headline that you're seeing on this work. I was really intrigued by being able to kind of navigate multiple narratives at once, which I think the exhibition does really beautifully overall. Um, the piece is small as well, right? It's kind of incredible in a show that has massive, you know, 25 foot long Last Supper paintings and enormous room filling uh, evocations of the Raphael Madonna to select something that's effectively the size of the New York Post um, and is actually cropped, so even smaller than the typical kind of uh, newspaper front page, if you will. But it hits you immediately. It's it's in black and white. And I know we can dig into the headlines, but um, there are just layers to this piece. It's from 1983, so it's uh, quite late in Warhol's career comparatively. But it fits in really well because the exhibition as a whole um, really navigates between works from the 1950s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and includes lots of um, interesting ephemera from Warhol's life, even his uh, childhood. Um, so there's uh, there's definitely a date range within the show. And I think that this, uh, this work is sort of like a, a period at the end of a sentence. Okay, so let's dig down into those headlines. So as you say, it's a cropped front page of the New York Post. Tell us about it. Yes, yeah, so we're seeing in black and white um, a silkscreened version of the April 1st, 1983 front page of the New York Post. So it is the 80s logo of the New York Post. It blares out at us. Um, but truly, that headline catching effect comes from the headline itself that Warhol selected very specifically. So the headline that really reaches your eyes and is used as the title says, Judge Blasts Quote Lynch, Judge Blasts Lynch. Above it is another headline that reads, Race Slay Teenager Gets 5 to 15 Years, um, with the image of said teenager, Gino Bova. And of course, as Americans, perhaps, as people who know the United States history, it's quite easy to fill in the second half of the lynch mob that the judge is referring to. Um, this uh, this case, if you will, is one that's very close to the history of Brooklyn and the people of Brooklyn. Um, Gino Bova was part of a group of young white teenagers who beat up a group of black men going home after their uh, day's work as transit workers. And William Turks was murdered as a result of this beating. Um, De Dennis Dixon and Donald Cooper were also severely injured. And as the sentencing is proclaimed, um, there actually was some accountability in this case um, for this horrible lynch mob, as the judge calls it. So there's immediately this kind of sense of accountability, retribution, judgment, if you will. Judgment in an exhibition that's about the kind of Catholic overlay on so many of Warhol's work um, is absolutely the key word here. Um, this painting, as small as it is, sits in the gallery with some kind of more iconic, to borrow your word, images by Warhol, including a massive orange disaster, number three from the Guggenheim, a repeated orange painting of um, electric chairs, the electric chair at Sing Sing, the year that the New York State stopped killing people with said electric chair. Um, so you see Warhol balancing kind of more political uh, state-based judgment with the judgment of God. There are works in the, in the um, exhibition that specifically see the image of Jesus Christ repeated with the word judge on it, in particular, a collaboration with Basquiat um, on 10 large punching bags that are actually just in the gallery right before this. So judgment is on your mind when you approach this painting. But there's so much more happening in the work. Um, beneath it, there's a little fragment of an image. The image itself is not there. So we're seeing that crop happens right under the, the heading of the image, which reads, Act of Humility in large, bold letters, just as bold as the Judge Blast Lynch fragment. And it reads, In a Holy Thursday reenactment of Christ's historic act, when he washed the feet of his apostles during the Last Supper, Pope John Paul kneels down to wash the feet of 12 homeless boys during Easter ceremonies in Rome yesterday. So right away, we have this kind of intense contrast of sort of competing narratives, competing headlines, um, the power and potential of violence and death kind of sitting with um, peace, forgiveness, mercy, servitude, um, the symbols or the meanings of uh, this recreation of Christ's gesture of washing the feet of his apostles. So there's a really interesting selection being made here by Warhol to call this out, to bring it to our attention, to recreate it. I also love how when you see the work in person and it is unglazed, which is pretty fantastic, um, it exceeds the kind of boundary of the canvas. You can see the silkscreen wrapping around the corners where it's sort of uh, been stretched over the bar. And I think that's that also kind of lends this sense of you know, visual impact, right? This piece is just as much about these kind of juxtaposing horrors and kind of forgiveness as much as it is 
about that imprint of media, the power of media and that attention grabbing nature of these kinds of headlines. Because Warhol was so deadpan when he delivered interpretations of his own work, he would often just allow people to interpret them and say, wow, or you're so smart or whatever, wasn't he? He would always sort of resist over speaking about a lot of his work. I wondered, though, if if he would have made that connection with the fact that racial violence, especially in the South of America, is associated with religious worship and so there's there's always been that direct correlation but the kkk being the most obvious example do you think mm-hmm. warhol is drawing attention to that here i think that's a really great point i feel like one of the reasons why warhol's work is so studied so exhibited so returned to is because of that kind of opening that warhol left for interpretation um often read as kind of a superficiality but i think also in some ways just allows for more interpretation, I think, than an artist could ever give their own work. I think there's something really interesting about this exhibition where it's not so much about defining Warhol um, and sort of finding that smoking gun, if you will, of, of these connections that he's making, but I think about specifically some of the other New York Post paintings that Warhol has made. Uh, in 1962, a much more painterly um, work called A Boy for Meg, um, just sort of announcing the birth of Prince Margaret's son, uh, Frank Sinatra profile, the weather, um, has a lot of emptiness as a, as a picture. Um, then in 1985, so just a couple years after the Judge Blass Lynch painting that we're talking about, was the Madonna on nude pics, so what headline of the New York Post, where Warhol and Keith Haring collaborated in this kind of colorful adornment of the headline describing, you know, Madonna being caught with these nude pictures and her sort of pop and feminist sort of acceptance again, so what? clarifying that. So for me, when I see a painting like this, we see uh, the headlines left as is. There's kind of a detachment in it, which perhaps is, you know, naturally a very kind of more holy and gesture. And I think the lack of embellishment or hand, if you will, in this work also allows us to really see the headlines, the realities of our times as they are. Um, And I, I have to say, there's kind of a third element to this. You know, there is the reality of the case of, you know, William Turks's murder. There's the um, papal moment on Holy Thursday, kind of talking about humility. And then there's this great detail, too, on the top of the um, of the page, a sweepstakes, a chance to win a $50,000 Easter nest egg. And it's illustrated with this great graphic image of an Easter egg kind of nestled in some grass. And there's just something so poignant to me about that, um, that chance, right? A, a very kind of United States the myth of upward mobility through purchasing power that you can maybe hopefully win this money that hopefully will have you um, secure in your housing. Um, I think that's kind of a really intense uh, use of, you know, obviously the Easter egg is is just as much a pop culture icon as it is a, um, a religious reminder of resurrection. But certainly I think the fact that these three headlines are navigating together uh, on this very tense um, and and sort of jumbled um, front page I feel like it is it's very intentional that Warhol elected to to crop it where he did as well, right? Um to to not show us the act of humility but instead have us sort of uh meditate on the idea of humility when faced with um this intense judgment and violence. Yeah. And it can't be any coincidence that, that it, this is obviously a Good Friday front page. Exactly. Yes. And he's depicting this appalling prejudice and and murder. And it, you know, that must have been of tremendous significance to him. Absolutely. Yeah. And the painting, um, it is installed in a new section that was added for the exhibition. One of the brilliant um, aspects of this exhibition, which was initially curated by Jose Carlos Diaz and debuted at the Warhol Museum, is its use of thematics. Uh, So it's not a chronological retelling of Warhol. Instead, we sort of start in the very beginning, looking at his immigrant roots, the the impact of of growing up in Pittsburgh's Ruska Dolina um, as a Byzantine Catholic, and then moves from there to themes about his images of women, to themes about the kind of corporeality and sensorial nature of the Catholic body, to the repetitions of the Last Supper, to his um, approaches to Renaissance masterpieces, right? And his kind of appropriation of of these great works. And then one of the kind of challenging aspects in bringing it to the Brooklyn Museum was recognizing that, of course, at the Warhol Museum, you have four other floors of Andy Warhol to take in while you're experiencing Revelation. 
So we actually added an entire new section to the Brooklyn Museum show um, that is sort of a zoomed out perspective. We titled it Material World, um, What We Worship. And in that section, we bring to bear some of these works about violence. Like I said, the Orange Disaster Electric Chair painting. Um, there are examples of his race riot works from 1964, which of course are titled Race Riot, but actually show police brutality um, against peaceful protesters in the children, uh, Birmingham Children's March. And it also sits in the same space with a giant 80s painting of a dripping dollar sign uh, with Heinz tomato boxes, uh, Del Monte peach boxes, uh, this sort of balance, um, acknowledgement of the reality of how power, authority, violence, um, these are all kind of the tenets of the United States, just as much as the kind of poppy, if you will, <laughs> imagery of consumerist icons. And I think that collapse is, is quite fascinating. And, and the section actually begins with some of these fantastic black and white paintings uh, of religious advertisements pulled from advertising pages. So we see a Jesus nightlight. We see kind of admonitions and warnings to, you know, heaven and hell are just one breath away. So I think it's fascinating that within that section, you sort of have these um, announcements, right? Advertising announcements of, of what's important, of what's desired, of what's hoped for, um, in this consumerist society. And I think that actually taking stock and, and going to that front page of the newspaper to see what's actually driving us, I think is a, is a quite interesting reveal in that section. Absolutely. Um, tell us about the sort of awareness of Warhol's religious beliefs, because of course, you know, there were, there were some references in his life during his lifetime, but the sort of the landmark moment, you know, as far as I'm aware, was, was when John Richardson did the eulogy for Warhol in which he he absolutely addressed his spirituality and and uh, immediately made that sort of oppositional point with some of the antics of in the factory for instance and some of the imagery <laughs> in the work so so tell us about that I mean does Richardson's eulogy still act as a kind of foundation of the sort of scholarship around around this area? Um, I think m maybe not so much a foundation almost like an illustration because I think with this exhibition you know we're able to present over 130 artworks, dozens of items of ephemera, again, this kind of thematic outlay of Catholicism's imprint on Warhol's work and in some ways on his life. And that kind of literal revelation to the gathered, you know, celebrity crowds of his St. Patrick's uh, uh, funeral, I think is, is such a moment, right? Like you said, a lot of people were shocked in some ways so to be juxtaposed with an image of of a Warhol that was perhaps more interior um, than they anticipated, right? Thinking about spirituality's impact on, on how one comports oneself. Um, but I think within the show, you can actually trace, um, you know, a at times very genuine um, approach to these themes. Um, there are works in the exhibition that really, I think, showcase attention, right? I think one of the realities of this exhibition and of ourselves as individuals is that we contain contradictions, we contain multitudes. And so I think in some ways, when you read about, you know, the Warhola family, for example, being very proud of um, Andy's support of his nephew's pre-studies and um, remarking on his um, continued prayers with his mother, his mother, Julia Warhola, several of her drawings are in the exhibition. They lived together for 20 years in New York. And, you know, there are ephemeral traces, uh, letters, and, and bulletins showing how, you know, she maintained a kind of spiritual collect connection for the war, you know, for, for herself, for Andy. Um, he, you know, made space to give meals to homeless individuals in New York on holy days. Um, and especially after his shooting um, and his near death in 1968 by Valerie Solanas, um, there is this kind of apocryphal story of him, you know, promising on his deathbed, you know, to God, if I get through this, and lo, a lot of reports have talked about Warhol becoming more God-fearing, um, stopping into church more frequently. Um, and I think it's interesting to also juxtapose that more glitz and glamour funeral that you called out in New York City um, with his actual funeral service later in Pittsburgh in a traditional Byzantine Catholic church. And he's laid to rest with his parents in Pittsburgh. Um, so I think there's kind of a, a full circle moment there where you can kind of understand his life from his beginnings in Pittsburgh in an ethnic enclave that was absolutely supported by the work, the ritual, the visual culture of St. John Chrysostom um, onto, you know, finding his way back there. Um, and I think there have been Interesting aspects of this drawn out, I think the most notable is Dr. Jane Dillenberger's 2001 book, The Religious Art of Andy Warhol, um, beautifully illustrated as well. Um, and I think it's 
she particularly focused on the last decade of his life. So I think what's brilliant about Jose's exhibition is that it goes far beyond that and sort of makes these connections earlier on in Warhol's career um, to, to point out, um, yeah, this, again, a career-long expanse of engagement with Catholic themes. Certainly Catholicism itself is a very visual culture as well. So um, you can sort of sense that imprint in, in a lot of the works. It's certainly true in, in my case that when I learnt about his Catholicism and then started looking at the work, it was amazing how much it just seemed to be hiding in plain sight. It's, and and that if, if you haven't twigged it and then you look back at the earth, you think, oh, my God, how, how didn't I know this? You know, <laughs> Right, right. And I mean, considering, you know, the the attention to Warhol, it's almost surprising that there is such an incredible large facet of uh, underexplored aspect of his career. But, you know, Jose says it really beautiful. Uh, beautifully talking about how this exhibition in some ways kind of humanizes him. I think it's fascinating to sometimes feel that the art world is maybe allergic to themes of religion and to maybe acknowledging that artists have these um, interior spiritual practices, rituals, um, traditions within them. And I think this exhibition is, you know, just a really interesting way to learn something new about an artist that, you know, perhaps you feel like you might know, right? Everybody knows Warhol's image. He's imprinted, especially in the lives and minds of New Yorkers. Um, and to actually take a rather deep dive on a grand scale um, through this theme. Again, there's, you know, works from all decades of his career. That's a, that's why I think the title really works well, this revelation. Of course, like it's a, in some ways a biblical reference, but also, you know, points to to the surprise I think a lot of our visitors will, will feel, especially when they walk into the first gallery and see this monumental Raphael Madonna. Well, thank you, Carmen, so much for telling us about this show. Thank you so much, Ben, for having me. It's great to be on the podcast. Andy Warhol, Revelation, is at the Brooklyn Museum until the 19th of June, 2022. And finally this week, Moscow Museums. Guest 2, House of Culture, the VAC Foundation's new museum, opens in the Russian capital on the 4th of December in a power station converted by the architect Renzo Piano. And the Garage Museum announced this week that it's expanding into the historic Hexagon Pavilion next door to its present building. The redevelopment of Ivan Joltovsky's 1923 building, which has been neglected for decades, will be overseen by the Japanese architect Sana. Both the Guest 2 and Garage buildings were built in the 20th century, a period with which Russia has a chequered history in terms of architectural preservation. Meanwhile, Guest 2 and the Garage have joined with the State Pushkin Museum of Fine Arts and the State Trechikov Gallery to form a new association, M4. But, as we've heard on this podcast in the past, these grand new institutions are being developed amid a political climate in which there's been a highly publicised crackdown on artist activists critical of the government and its conservative policies. I spoke to Anna Brunovitska, architectural historian, professor at the Moscow Architecture School and head of research at the Institute of Modernism about the new buildings and the wider culture. Anna, Guest 2 is about to open and then the Garage have just announced that they are about to develop the so-called Hexagon. And both of these are 20th century buildings, but you're a specialist in modernist architecture particularly. Where do these buildings fit in with the kind of uh, 20th century architecture in, in Moscow? Are they landmark buildings? To what extent do you view them as important historic spaces? They're totally different. Gastois is a power station built at, the, at 1906, I think. And it's uh, like a normal industrial building from this era. And it's part of the industrial area which is very central uh, and which was built in 20 years, mostly. Yes, or, uh, so before the revolution. And it's just a normal industrial style with some what they call neo-Russian details. But generally it's a brick building, much like uh, they were built at the time all around Europe, at least. Indeed. And the hexagon is different, right? And the hexagon, yes, uh, it's, uh, it's unique, totally unique. Uh, it was built for the agricultural exhibition held in Moscow in 1923. So it was actually uh, the first uh, large event uh, Soviet times in the new Soviet capital. And it's also the first opportunity to architects to show some, to build something, you know. Most of it were wooden temporary constructions. 
but it was a field for experiments. For example, famous Mahorka Pavilion by Konstantin Melnikov was part of this exhibition. And uh, the hexagon, uh, it was a pavilion of agricultural machinery, and it was designed by Ivan Zhiltovsky, who uh, developed the master plan for the whole exhibition, so he was like the top architect for, for it, and it was the only building, building on this exhibition complex that was built not of wood, but uh, of reinforced concrete, and this is why it survived. Right. Okay. And so, so, so it, it survived, but it's been neglected for a long time. Is that right? Yes. It's a, it's a total ruin. Total ruin. You know, after the exhibition finished, in a few years, uh, it was turned into the park of culture, Gorky Park, and some of the pavilions served for this park for a long time, uh, but they disappeared gradually. And, uh, of course, this uh, concrete building was to the latest, and it was uh, used as a canteen, cafe, dancing place, uh, some small factory, etc. And it was uh, changed a lot. It was constantly adapted for the new use. And then it was abandoned, and then there was a big fire. So for the last 30 years, probably it sits like it's not even a shell, but a, a concrete skeleton of a building. But it is a protected monument. I'm, I'm really interested in this idea about protected monuments, because one of the things that I've read consistently in the art newspaper over the years mm-hmm. is about the ambivalence w- within Moscow, within Russia generally, towards modernist buildings or buildings from the, from the early Soviet period. Is that still the case, or is it only certain monuments get a level of protection? Well, of course, not enough. Too much from the point of view uh, of the city and developers. But um, for the public who care about architectural heritage, uh, nearly not enough. And also the status doesn't always protect the building. So what uh, would happen, uh, uh, it's uh, partly for the protection authorities and partly for the owner. But still there are some regulations. So. You know, with the powerhouse, which will be this new art space for the VAC Foundation, you could do more or less what you want with it. And with the hexagon, not so much. So you must preserve the general shape uh, and structure. So would you say then that there is an element of the city planning, an element of reverence for modernist building now in in Moscow and Russia? In Moscow, you know, the situation is changing, it's changing. And many buildings from the 20s, so-called avant-garde period, are now protected or listed at least, you know, it's not the same. And now we have finally a few examples of very good restoration uh, as um, the Narconfield building, which, which was restored just a year ago. And uh, still, for the later part of the century, for the post Stalinist modernist architecture, there are very few examples of listed buildings, you know, and even if they are somehow listed, they are not really protected. I wanted to talk about, obviously, these are really landmark projects, but they are both private, um, in, you know, in the, in the sense that, you know, um, Roman Abramovich, it seems to me, bought the hexagon building when he first made plans mm-hmm. with Dasha mm-hmm. Sokova to, to do the garage project, etc. So it's, it, this has been in the offing for some time. Obviously, the VAC Foundation is also a private foundation. So what kind of public commitment is there to culture and to the creation of cultural spaces? government now supports museums, you know, large uh, official institutions like the Pushkin Museum, the Tretikov Gallery, and both this uh, major museum in Moscow are expanding, building new buildings and getting new spaces uh, in uh, existing buildings. 
so there I would say that there is um, yes um, noticeable commitment right and obviously from our point of view as the, as the art newspaper we're interested in this idea of contemporary culture and its manifestations taking place because of course like for instance one of the things that they're saying about the the hexagon project is that it will create spaces for performance art but another thing that we also know is that that very many of the the liberal performers, the avant-garde performers that whose work is being clamped down upon are, you know, from the performance art community. And, it, and does, that, that seems to be a, a level of a contradiction. So c- can you explain sort of the, the, the wider culture and the attitude towards contemporary art in, in Moscow? <laughs> yes, it's a bit of schizophrenic situation because probably the general situation in Russia is very conservative you know, and the state uh, promotes so-called traditional values uh, and intolerance to minorities, especially sexual minorities and feminism even. But there are also some, you know, informal support groups for these traditional values. So... Uh, they crush uh, the performances or exhibitions and do terrible things and the police do, don't stop them, you know. So they obviously feel some state support behind them. But um, these private institutions, and not just private, but they're baked by very influential people, very rich and influential people, and uh, these people are able to establish spaces that they are excluded from this climate, and they create possibility to support minorities, to promote tolerance uh, and inclusion. You know, uh, the boss of these institutions started uh, programs for uh, people with disabilities, with, uh, for migrants, uh, with um, events in uh, various languages for minorities living in Russia, unprivileged minorities. So cultural public uh, have these spaces. And, you know, even if you, uh, we don't take into account this uh, state policies, Russian culture is very traditional, you know, because uh, school education is very conservative, very conservative. So people who think of themselves as cultured people, they would go to classical concerts or to see classical art. Or uh, maybe now avant-garde art as well. I mean, avant-garde of the early 20th century, uh, but uh, not contemporary art. So there was a very narrow segment of public who was willing to learn how to understand, uh, how to see contemporary art. And this segment is rapidly growing due to the these programs, you know, some of them are held by the public museums, as the Tretikov Gallery maybe, but the Garage Museum uh, already made a great difference. Yeah, I mean, that, that's the thing, isn't it? That, 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 you know, I mean, in, in before COVID, the, the, the numbers of visitors that the Garage Museum was getting were very healthy. There were sort of about a million visitors a year. And therefore, if you have this sort of strange balance where you don't really want to educate there's a conservative educational program for the wider population but you have public spaces where the wider population can access contemporary art as you say and avant-garde ideas it seems to be a contradiction ah yes but uh, you know it's very difficult to explain logically there are some theories that it's a kind of a permitted outlet, you know, so uh, we live in a society where our freedom uh, uh, gets diminished day by day, uh, and maybe as a, uh, we need so-called government or power sees the need to have some outlets so people would not get desperate. But 
you know, um, maybe for the last two years, I don't think that uh, the power cares about our feeling. Maybe the worse we feel, the better for them. So to, I don't know, press us uh, into submission or press us out of the country. So uh, I'm not sure. I'm just happy that we have these spaces and these opportunities. I mean, one of the things that's, that I'm interested in is, is to what extent these are sort of centres, these are houses of culture with multidisciplinary a- approach, which of mm-hmm. course is a very modernist idea in all sorts of ways, like lots of those early modernist movements wanted to do that. But I wonder to what extent it's really sort of the, the kind of performers, the kind of artists that are appearing there are very much international artists as opposed to local avant-garde figures. Do, you know, you talk about how, yes, there are centres where you can see contemporary culture, but can you see references to the kind of contemporary culture that is being clamped down upon by the state in other words is there is there a kind of safety in in making international programs with international artists rather than looking towards the local community of artists and avant-garde figures both this organization also promote uh, local talent and it's important that they bring international art uh, because it's healthy and it's not this international art uh, is presented not to, um, to exclude local artists from the process, but to create an uh, environment for them, I think. And what about the educational side of it? Because obviously that's important too, isn't it? Again, these spaces promote themselves as having a very educational outlook. Do you think that bears fruit? Can you see that they do provide educational services, which in some ways might be a counterpoint to that conservative education that you were talking about earlier on? Uh, Yes, of course. Uh, Of course, the scale is not very much, uh, in particular with the VIC uh, Foundation, because they are just open in the large space. But for a few years now, maybe even 10 years, they are doing small programs, educational and research. And it's maybe more complex than what the garage doing, because the garage is uh, trying to access a wider public with uh, film screenings and uh, performance festivals even outside their building and a wide publication program. And they see also has publication program, but uh, they publish uh, more scholarly books, I would say. In terms of the way that the buildings are being converted, um, obviously we've only seen Sana's plans for the new um, garage mm-hmm. building, but um, Renzo Piano's conversion of guest two is is now um you know it's about to open so tell me what you um make of the way that piano has dealt with that building well uh, it's a bit controversial you know personally i'm happy with it but i know that uh, some people uh, from the heritage protection community are unhappy with the way that uh, external walls are treated uh, because they lost their um, ornaments, you know, ornaments with brick cladding, and now it's just more smooth walls. And another important change, uh, the power station uh, had lost its uh, original um, brick chimneys uh, some time ago. And they could be reconstructed, yes, the building could be returned to its original, uh, very impressive uh, shape. But Renzo Piano opted differently. He recreated the chimneys, but uh, they are metal and of different proportions and set closer to the center of the building. And at some point, he decided to paint them bright blue. And the last decision, it provoked uh, protest, you know, from uh, from many people because uh, they uh, look provocative. And 
when I first read about it, yes, I was also puzzled. But now that I can see how these chimneys are looking against the sky, when the sky is blue and with these blue chimneys, I think it's just brilliant. So I like it. The building itself, you know, it's... Uh, has a lot of uh, free space inside. It's a bit like this uh, Tate Modern uh, space. And it has uh, several editions, uh, like um, large audience, performance hall, and also some workshops uh, for the artist, local artist, mostly. Right. Yeah. And uh, this part is... Um, used to be warehouse for a vodka factory oh, right. <laughs> that existed. Yes. And they were hidden in Soviet times. They just found them when they started to clear the space uh, uh, around uh, the power station. And it's brick walls. Uh, they look really good um, and they're quite useful. And another element is the birch forest, you know, and it's totally unexpected. And I also think it's brilliant, you know, because we don't have nearly enough greenery in central Moscow. And this is very central Moscow. Right. And it looks fantastic. And it's also created totally new views on the so-called house of government, uh, you know, famous house on embankment from the 20s. Right, so that's really interesting. Um, I, I, and I wanted to ask you also about this idea. We've um, we've heard that that four of the, the museums, Guest Two, mm -hmm. uh, the Trechikov, the Pushkin, and Garage, have gathered together under a under a single entity called called M Four, a kind of collaborative entity of some sort. Mm -hmm. Not an official, and you know, they're separate museums, but but they they are, they are sort of talking about a sort of collegiate atmosphere. What do you make of this? Is this is this a turning point in terms of the way museums behave in Moscow? I'm not sure, and I don't think that uh, even the museums are uh, sure what, how it will evolve. For now, it's just uh, some sightseeing routes between them, and I actually helped to develop uh, an agricultural walk between these four museums and uh, five buildings, actually, because the Tretikov uh, Gallery has two buildings. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I can't actually see uh, how a person would visit first Tretikov Gallery or Pushkin Museum and then go to the garage because they are large museums. <laughs> and, uh, but probably they will have some festivals. And another thing that all these museums are very close to the river. So it's possible, and I think there is a plan to create uh, some um, board connection between them for special events. So you, you'd say this is a good sign in terms of creating a kind of cultural community in, in the city? Yes, of course. And it's uh, also a really good sign, uh, this collaboration between two major public museums and private museums, and also... Uh, museums of uh, classical art and contemporary art. And both Tretikov Gallery and the Pushkin Museum now include much more contemporary art and events in their programs. OK, well, Anna, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. Guest 2, House of Culture, opens in Moscow on the 4th of December. And that's all for this episode. We're on Twitter at Tan Audio and on Facebook and Instagram, of course. The Week in Art is produced by Julia Mahalska, Amy Dawson and David Clack. And David is also the editor and sound designer. Thanks also to Henrietta Bentel and Daniela Hathaway and to this week's guests, Georgina, Carmen and Anna. And thank you for joining us. See you next week. Bye for now. The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Visit christies.com to find out more about the world's leading auction house since 1766. Auction, private sales, online, art, anytime.